Welcome to the oldest social and business club in India, the Bengal Club. Set up in 1827 as a meeting place where people from the military, the judiciary, businessmen and professionals of the British Empire gathered together. Independence brought about a change in clientele, but not in character. Professionals, businessmen, people from the service sector, bureaucrats and academics started rubbing shoulders in the corridors of this hallowed institution. Welcome to the library of the Bengal Club, an institution within an institution. A veritable collection of books, the like of which you're unlikely to find anywhere else in the city and indeed in this country. Recordings by famous speakers who have spoken here in the library and a collection of books on any subject that you may want to look for. Books by Nobel laureates, books by Bengal Club members, books on political science, philosophy, ethics and morality, food and drink, sports and culture. Mention the subject and it's available here. There is also a small Wi-Fi corner where you can browse the internet in peace. They said there is no subject under the sun. If you're looking for a book, you will find it on these shelves of the Library of the Bengal. Envy the books, enjoy the collection, but above all, celebrate in the ambience of this wonderful library, the Library of the Bengal Club. Welcome to see the other famous individuals who have launched their books on this site. And recordings of that book launch are also available in this library. Welcome to the Library of the Big Wall Club. On behalf of the Library Subcommittee, welcome to this program. Good evening, dear members, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce Mr. Partho Ranjan Das, who is not only known for his renowned, as a renowned master architect, but has many other attributes like restoration of old buildings in Kolkata, which has made him a distinguished personality. It makes me feel all the more proud as Partho is a part of our general committee and his contribution over the years has been invaluable in restoration of this age-old club and which is going to have his bicentenary in 2027. Partho is an architect, urban designer and conservationist based in Kolkata. He is a member of the West Bengal Heritage Commission and Center for Archaeological Studies and Training in Eastern India. He graduated from Jadapur University in the year 1984 and did his first postgraduate degree in urban design from the School of Planning and Architecture, New Delhi, in the same year. He received the Fulbright Scholarship 
to study American architecture in 1991. He started his own practice in 1987, but took a break in 2008 to complete a master's diploma in conservation of historic buildings from Lund University, Sweden. He has restored the town hall, the treasury building, St. Paul's Cathedral, and many other landmarks in Kolkata. He has received many national and international awards for his designs. He is a visiting faculty to many colleges in India and abroad. He illustrates regularly for children's magazine, including Sandesh, published by Satyajit Ray's family. He is a member of the governing body of the Satyajit Ray Society. He is working in rural Bengal for the last 35 years, developing low-cost construction methods for non-urban areas. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a big hand to our Parthoranjan Das. And I now invite him to the stage. His presentation today will be on the amazing architecture of Spain's Alhambra. Now all to you, Parto. Thank you, brother. Thank you for your wonderful introduction. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to talk about uh, Alhambra in Spain, a little bit about architecture, a little bit about its history and uh, how it's being, you know, maintained and restored today. Uh, it's in southern part of Spain, uh, which was uh, known as Andalusia when it was under the Muslims. Uh, it's on a hill. The hill is on, on the uh, western side of Granada. And uh, on this hill, uh, it's, it's, it's on, a, on a plateau and uh, laid in a very organic manner. Normally, when we come across uh, Islamic architecture, we see that there is an emphasis on the cardinal points, the north-south direction. If you look at our gardens, famous gardens like Shalimar or Nishad Bagh in Kashmir, they are laid on a straight line and the axis of north-south is very, very prominent. And that's true for all large uh, architecture, uh, Islamic architecture especially, on plain land. You look at Fatehpur Sikhi, look at, look at many other places. There's a strong, and I'm talking about India, I mean, if you look at the Middle East, all the major, and also in North Africa, major architecture, you know, has a strong uh, emphasis on the north and south because of, you know, religious reasons. They could not do it here because of the configuration of the hill. It initially was built as a fort, and therefore, you know, the fortification was most important, and therefore, the organic pattern which follows the contours of the land. So, uh, if you uh, look at, um, I'll just go back to the history of why the famous Islamic architecture happened in Spain. We have to go back a little and start with contribution of the uh, Muslim uh, conquerors from Middle East and also uh, the culture of North Africa and how, you know, it intermixed in the East and traveled west and finally came into Spain and how it affected uh, uh, the Spanish architecture and the evolving of Moorish architecture, which actually uh, is, um, Alhambra is the final result of. Uh, if you look at the Roman Empire, Roman Empire was uh, not only Southern Europe and part of uh, Asia Minor, but also uh, some part of uh, North Africa, which was, you know, facing Mediterranean. Initially, Roman Empire was large, but you know, like it happens in all large empires, it was finally divided into two, East and West. West was, you know, largely Spain, France, and uh, the Western part of Europe, and large part of North Africa. And it remained very conservative in terms of their culture, art, and architecture. There was no intermixing. The intermixing happened in the eastern part, where, you know, uh, Constantine had built his uh, capital in Constantinople, which is Istanbul. 
and therefore they encourage a lot of intermixing with the Arabs, the Muslim, and that evolved a new kind of architecture, which is not typically Arab, not typically uh, Roman, but a very eclectic mix of everything altogether. Whereas the Roman architecture, which uh, came to North Africa in the olden times, like Carthage, like Alexandria, that was typically Roman architecture without any influence of the Moors or the North Africans. Later on, before the Ottoman Empire actually overthrew the Byzantine Empire, it had actually shrunk and then gradually came to the central part of Europe, but it had carried with it you know, the cultural mix. That is why if you go to Venice, you see a slight, you know, influence of Moorish architecture. Venice, the architecture that we come across, is not purely Roman. Uh, it had a lot of interaction with, uh, because of trade and commerce with the uh, Eastern uh, uh, Roman Empire, and therefore it evolved a new architecture which is typically of its own, and if you go to St. Mark's Venice, it cannot be called purely Roman. It has a very strong influence of Moorish architecture. Uh, when it shrunk, actually, we can see that the Muslim conquest, the Islamic conquest, had started f spreading from the 7th century, middle of 7th century, started spreading and came to North Africa and they actually uh, conquered the Barbars, which are actually Tuareg. Tuaregs cannot be conquered. I mean, they were a nomadic tribe after all, but they were fierce fighters. And, you know, the initial uh, Islamic rulers, they were, they, they were two large uh, empires, one by the Abbasids, uh, originally the Umayyads, and then the Abbasids, and then the Umayyads came back and overthrew them. The difference of administration between the Umayyad and the Abbasids were, the Abbasids were basically empire builders. They spent all their money on development of their military force. But the Umayyads had a different idea of ruling their empires. So they developed their bureaucracy. They had the system of wazirs who understood taxation, how to collect taxes, how to spend the taxes. So they were actually interested in large-scale, stable administration. The emphasis of the Abbasids were development of the military, and they engaged military generals in running the country, running the empire. And therefore, we see that during the Abbasids, there are very, very little advancement in art, literature, and culture because the focus was different. Whereas during the Umayyad uh, uh, rule, we see that schools have been built, marketplaces, mosques, and many other public places, and they allowed the intermixing with other cultures and gradually developed you know, interesting styles of architecture in various parts of the world, this part of the world especially. This is an old painting showing the Barbar tribe. They were used extensively by the Umayyads while capturing the southern part of Europe, especially the Iberian Peninsula. Iberia is, you know, largely Spain and most of Portugal, almost the entire Portugal. And the word barbarian actually came from the Barbars. They are really cruel. And the way they celebrated their victory over the adversaries was, you know, cutting their head, hanging the head, from their bells like a trophy. So they were used by the Muslims to conquer uh, the southern Spain. In the middle of uh, early 8th century to middle of uh, the 8th century, they gradually moved into southern Spain and defeated the uh, uh, Visigoths and established their Umayyad Emirate of Al-Andalus, so therefore uh, Andalusia. It started a continuous strife between the Christian and the Muslim because the Christians wanted to uh, win over the Muslims and reconquer their kingdom in southern Spain. So initially, people confused, confused this uh, struggle with uh, mm, uh, the crusade, but the crusade was something different. Crusade was slightly disorganized. I will show you a map of how the crusade happens. This was not really the crusade, but the Spaniards agreed that this is not really the crusade. This is reconquering their own area. 
when crusade happened crusade had started originally from france and you can see that there were uh, six different attempts first four were complete failures complete failures because in france the church invited everybody and said that all your sins will be forgiven if you take part in crusade our target is to liberate jerusalem without any plan without any program a huge army of you know thousands of people started marching towards jerusalem now since it was a very emotional call and people also responded very emotionally there were no single leadership in the first few crusades every every small you know thousands of people gathered together around uh, some important knights and they started marching but how do you march from the western edge of europe to you know the uh, western part of asia which is jerusalem so they had to run through they had to march through towns and villages and when a huge army is moving where do they eat they started looting so during their march uh, from in the in the first four crusades during their march from the uh, france the coast of france and the rest of uh, europe uh, they marched through all the villages and towns and went on you know pillaging so there was a lot of resentment even among europeans that why should this crusade happen enough is enough let them let jerusalem manage their own thing we should be left free they were they were not encouraging the crusade at all so when the islam came the muslim rulers came they had this advantage especially the umayyads who were uh, uh, who believed in proper administration by appointing wazis and a proper bureaucracy they had tacit support of the general people from the europe so spain under islamic influence was like this it was a multicultural mix of muslims christians and jews and it was a peaceful period many people say that was the golden period in southern spain in andalusia where trade and commerce flourished because nobody was fighting so if you fight actually the taxes increase that was not required and uh, art architecture and literature had many patrons during this period because they had money they knew how where to spend the money and it matched almost you know the heights of roman empire and italian renaissance so this was the golden age of Isma islamic rule which was like from middle of 8th century to uh, the 11th century the decline of islamic rule was because you know they started being fragmented into small emirates when they were not ruled by one single uh, leader they were they started fragmenting that happened in the asia minor also the muslim rule ended in 1492 when granada which was their capital was finally conquered by the christians ferdinand and isabella and it was said that the last moor uh, had his last sigh and then emigrated to northern africa i mean not to be mixed with uh, the book which is written by salman rushdie that's a different story altogether so at their height this was what they had built which still remains one of the best known architectural jewels in europe alhambra is on a hill and if you look at basically the four rectangles they describe what is there in alhambra this is the initial part actually even though the city is here you climb you start climbing towards the entry entrance of alhambra from the from this side there was a reason it was initially built as a fort and in fort you have to you know constantly you're being attacked by the enemies and if you're attacked by anyone you have to defend yourself i'll come to that uh, this is the sorry this was the fort area part of it is still in ruins they say that there existed an old fort on which it was built several times and you enter from there which is the al kasbah and then this is the nasrid places the nasrid family is uh, the family who inherited this from the umayyads and they ran this part of southern spain and the capital at granada for uh, several hundred years then this is the other upper royal area and then this is uh, generally which is actually a garden 
generally if I actually means garden of the architects. I don't know why it was named like that. All everything was designed by architects, but that's how it is. So these four rectangles basically describe what is there in uh, entire Alhambra. It's a 26 acre site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and we will start, you know, from this area, which is the actually fort, fort area. It's a mix of Islam and Spanish architecture, Mediterranean architecture. So you see these tile roofs, when you see the tile roof from outside, this color of the stone is red and it is called Alhamra because of the first ruler who was named Alhamar. After him it was called Alhamra. And the reddish tile, slightly reddish stone, which is a very rough quality of stone, not a very high quality of stone, which is the external cladding. But the roof, because of rain and you know other uh, technologies available, it is all with you know wooden rafters and burnt clay tiles. So when you look at it from outside, you won't, don't understand what you're going to see from inside. So as you enter, you come across these ruins which have been excavated and restored to give an idea of what existed earlier. Uh, and this is uh, not restored very nicely. Alhambra has a history of very poor restoration. At times, you know, archaeologists use their own conjectural ideas and made something thinking that this is the most appropriate. Ra square columns were made into round columns because they thought they have followed Moroccan architecture before I can make it round, which is a disaster. Some architects also, you know, restored certain areas without uh, proper research and again it was a disaster. So what is happening now is UNESCO has appointed a team of restorers who is painstakingly uh, restoring the entire uh, Al Alhambra complex. It's a 26 acre site, so it will take time. It's a continuous process. This is the fort walls, the fortified walls. Now, I have already explained that the city is on the other side, and this is the eastern part. And the road actually leads to the main fort, the Al Kasbah, from the eastern side. So, you know, in those days, soldiers were trained to be right handed. Everybody carried their shield on the left hand side and the sword or the spear was on the right hand side. So when they were climbing the hill on horseback or on foot, the right side was always exposed to the fortified wall. It was deliberately done, that is why they actually took the road all around the castle so that they could pour hot oil, hot water or throw stones because this side was exposed always. This was a deliberate design. This is as you climb on one of these towers on the fortification, you get to see the entire ruin which was there earlier and the main fort with the watchtowers were built on top of this. If you come through the Al Kasba, through the fortified area, you come across a palace of Charles V. These are the Alhambra palaces. These were influenced by Italian architecture, but as you go inside, you can feel the Moorish influence. The Moorish influence came not only from North Africa, but also from the Middle East. We must remember that during their decline, or even in their peak, the Nasrid family were not very rich. They did not have enough money to replicate what they have seen in, let's say, Iraq or Syria, or Uzbekistan, the grand uh, palaces and the mosques of uh, the Islamic countries could not be replicated here. They did not have access to uh, alabaster or good quality marble, so they resorted to stucco, which is made with stone dust but not really stone. But they excelled in other areas, I'll come to that. The palace actually is square from outside, but inside it's a circle. So from inside, it's a complete circle and the beauty of Alhambra is that no entry or exit leads you straight to the next complex. It's always, you have to turn because it was originally a fort, you have to turn through some narrow doorway and then turn right and then you come to uh, another another complex, let's say the palaces. 
it also adds to the surprise, the element of surprise, because for a visitor who's going through, he's not able to see everything at one go. I mean, this is a simple uh, concept of urban design, which was uh, followed by the Greek and many others in the medieval times, but not by the Romans or by the Muslims. The Romans were a military race. They believed in uh, straight lines, that when you enter a place and you're marching towards another place, you should be able to see what is on either side and your final destination. But the Greeks and the other urban designers, the city developers, they believed in you know, enhancing the experience of the visitor who is actually walking through in a meandering uh, you know, walkway, through arches, through you know, turns and twists, so that you know, there are surprises, something comes up suddenly and you suddenly uh, feel elated that uh, this was completely unexpected. So this is something like that. You enter through one of the doors and then you come to a portico, which is Spartal. And it's a small uh, portico, which again leads you to the other areas. It has a simple water body and people could, you know, in that weather, you know, sit around this area. It is said that when Christopher Columbus started his journey, he started his journey from here. He actually was just about starting his journey uh, during the you know middle of 15th century, he actually witnessed the fall of uh, this Nasserid Empire, the fall of the Islamic rule in Iberia. And from here is where he declared that he is going to the USA. There are all sorts of funny stories that he carried with him an interpreter because he thought he's going to India. And finally, when he landed in Cuba and he asked his interpreter to talk to the uh, local people, uh, both the interpreter and the local people were surprised. They did not understand each other. But that's a different story. I'll come to that later on. And that was, a, again, some kind of a disaster. Uh, uh, this is a, a place in, in that portal area where you can see that some of the tiles, the colored tiles, and some of the decorations have been taken away. Now, decorations were taken away not only from the floor, but also from the wall. You know, in India, we always criticize Indians who write their names in Ajanta and Ilora and take away stuff, saying that, you know, we are uncultured. But this is happening in Alhambra and it happened right up to 19th century. And people have written about it, that people take away these things as souvenirs. And where do I find these souvenirs today? Many people, in a very celebrated manner, have presented them to the Victoria and Albert, the VNA and the British Museum. You know, elites of England, they, they took away tiles and decorative pieces of stucco and they are now in all the, in, the, in the museums. In Germany, there are some museums. In UK, there are museums which has, you know, parts of this. Mare's Handbook to Spain, it was written in 1912, calls it the vulgar and rather disgusting habit of cutting names, similar to what we have done in Ojinta and Ilora and tearing off pieces of plaster and tiles from the Alhambra. Now, Nasrid places start from here. From here, you see the decorations are changing. This is called uh, the Court of the Martyrs. Martyrs actually is the name of the hedge which is there. And from here, you enter the inside areas. It is divided into the following, the Mexuar, which was built by Muhammad V, then the Kumaris Palace, which was built by Mohammed V. He built maximum amount of the palaces. In 1370, the court of the martyrs, martyrs is the edge, the plant that you see, outdoor area, and the palace of the lions, which is the main ornamental pavilion that uh, Alhambra is famous for. So as we go through these palaces, we see that there is very little light from the ceiling. Many people have commented that Architecture is to be enjoyed during the daytime. But Alhambra was basically a place for entertainment. The Nasrid kings, they actually went down below the mountain and they uh, did uh, all kinds of stuff, all kinds of activities during the daytime, came back at night and they had, you know, big parties, entertainments. So, Alhambra was basically built to be enjoyed at night. That is why, you know,
the all the princes and the emirs they spent a huge amount of money for buying candles large amount of candles and alhamra was actually lit from the bottom so there are no lights from the top if you go to any mosque i'll show you some examples in mosque the lights the candles are hung from the ceiling and there are arrangements because these lights the chandeliers used to be extremely heavy but not in alhamra because alhamra was primarily meant to be a place to be enjoyed at night alhamra is famous for stucco and the tiles if you see examples of great architecture in the middle east islamic architecture they are made of very expensive stone and very expensive tiles of all kinds of colors and the inlays inside the stones are also of very expensive stones like they have done in taj mahal stones from all over the world but in alhamra it was mainly stucco so there is a lot of relief there is a lot of depth in the decoration that they have used and the colors were hand painted there are some arches where we see that the colors are coming off there are a lot of false ceiling because it was a pitch roof they had to use false ceiling and most of the false ceilings were in wood but because they had moorish influence many of the false ceilings were also made of leather the advantage with leather is that it could be painted at the ground level and then fixed on top which is a unique thing in alhambra the hanging decoration that we see also of you know the crushed stone stucco is influence from stalactite and stalagmite this is a unique feature only in islam you see a very uh, refined uh, uh, shortened form in some christian architecture and some hindu architecture but the muslim uh, crafts people and architects they had taken it to a different level altogether i mean they uh, uh, these are done with stucco but in other areas like isfahan in herat in syria they were done with stone so you don't understand how they are made to look so light there was one advantage of this other than decoration that is acoustics when people were talking it absorbed all the noise that was a great thing about this uh, stalactite type of thing the other thing which was interesting in islam is that they used a lot of calligraphy you know quotes from the quran and they used it in a very decorative manner so it became part of the decoration part of the uh, stucco relief that was provided if you look at all the arches you will see that all the arches have this stucco relief on top we see the spanish influence of the tiles and whatever little is projecting out the space below the tile is a wooden fall ceiling and because it's exposed to the water the wooden fall ceiling used to get rotten very easily it still does and there is a continuous effort of restoring them which is very expensive we come to the last part which is the palace of lions palace of lions because at the center there is a fountain and there are four lions stylized lions of course standing it appears that they are holding on to the thing but it is not the lions are separate and the fountain is separate they are holding on to the fountain this is the most delicate work ever seen in any of the islamic architecture the moorish architecture in southern europe i mean the size of the columns the structure itself is astounding i mean this is on a hill and uh, it's very very slender and the height is also quite high and if you look at this structure which is the entrance portico to any of these this is a, actually a square this is influenced by uh, moorish architecture i'll show you how it was influenced but in the palace of the lions it's absolutely solid uh, you know ornamental work all around it must have taken years of course it has taken years and uh, as it is uh, stucco uh, its restoration has its own problems it's very finely worked out they had employed laborers uh, which were the christian prisoners and most of the workers came from north africa not from middle east 
and this exquisite work when it breaks it becomes very difficult to restore but their geometry is something to be really admired here you can see that something a smaller example of this stalactite and stalagmite and the paints are all blue painted hand painted it's not like what we see in middle east their blue is actually tiles not only blue the yellow the red everything the, the colors used were you know tiles so that's more permanent in nature unfortunately you know the most of the middle eastern architecture islamic architecture will gradually get destroyed but this will not alhamra will stay because it's in southern spain you can see that's because they don't have any uh, shutters some amount of water is seeping through so there is continuous uh, restoration happening here you can see a part of the fountain which is at the center and uh, because of the the jali the the uh, perforations within this air is passing through the entire complex so you don't feel the heat you feel as if it's entirely air conditioned and most of the visitors go during the day time at night when it was actually used by the original owners it must have been absolutely air conditioned a part of the ceiling where you can see that how they have achieved it is impossible to understand how they have achieved this is completely hanging and obviously they did not hang any lights from there these are some night views of alhamra and you can see that when it is lit from the bottom it has a different character altogether and alhamra was actually designed for enjoyment at night only for entertainment this is also you know these are a collage of photographs at night this is an example of a false ceiling made of leather large piece of leather which is painted you can see a restorer painstakingly taking out the stain from one of the wooden doors this is part of the wooden false ceiling part of the stucco and then we end with general leaf which is the garden it's in a elaborate vegetable garden which is quite long and that also ends in a pavilion from which you can look down upon the city uh, and this is the last slide of the general leaf and then as you come out the guide tells you about the dark side of alhamra how alhamra was built how people were exploited how did they imprison the christian laborers christian laborers were actually imprisoned below one of the watch towers in a pyramidal basement pyramidal because the entry was only from the top there was no ventilation no light nothing after the end of the day they were put inside that dungeon and taken out again during the morning if somebody died his body used to be picked up and that happened for hundreds of years this was happening in 13th and 14th century just remember that during 14th century slavery was abolished from rest of europe but not here not in southern fen because they would not survive without slavery so there are many books written where it is written that you know the tourists admire the architecture and ornamentation of Al alhamra and fantasize that it must have been a paradise or not truly it was but granada in the 14th and 15th century was a special kind of hell for the slaves and the general public so alhamra some people have commented is also a monument to murder slavery poverty and fear so all this which was built had this dark history there was islamic influence they wanted to copy alhamra of course was a attempt to copy the great architecture of the original islamic you know Uh, this areas of uh, kabul and istanbul and herat and syria and damascus and but they were built with original stones all the umayyad palaces and the abbasid buildings this is a mosque in syria everything that is used is stone original stone and stained glass but what they actually followed the, from the islamic palaces and mosques and madrasas is the strict geometry i mean everything was divided according to a module 
which was extended and followed all over, even in the design of the tiles, and everything which was designed had, could be you know, transferred into a strict geometrical uh, system. So what everything was bad about this period? In 1949, there was a film made by David O. Selznick. Carol Reed was the director. The name of the movie was The Third Man. The Third Man is based on the life of Kim Philby. Kim Philby was a famous Russian double agent who was in England and then finally he defected. He was a committed communist. In Russia, he became a big hero. So there are a number of books written on Kim Philby. And this was one written by Graham Greene. In this film, Orson Welles acts as a character called Harry Lyme. And Orson Welles' character is only there for five minutes. But the dialogue that he delivers is very, uh, wonderfully you know, true for so many uh, kingdoms and emirates. He said that in Italy for 30 years under the Borgias, the Spanish Pope, they had warfare, terror, murder and bloodshed. But also they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci and the Renaissance. Now comes the best part. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace. And what did they produce? The cuckoo clock. <laughs> so when we see the black part of Alhambra, the strike, the war, the fighting, parallelly, you know, uh, this also uh, is, uh, happens. I mean, people encourage art and culture and poetry and architecture and whatnot. So similarly, uh, we see the influence of Islam in Alhambra, which was replicated in a very simple and uh, cost-effective way. They did not have access, they did not have money, they did not have access to the tile making and the stones, but the Islamic influence was there. The direct influence was from North Africa, from Morocco and Fez and Marrakesh. These were the main inspirations, but finally, they, since they could not replicate this, that is why you see mostly it is monochromatic in Alhambra, mostly. Even though it's very exquisitely done, mostly it is monochromatic because it was uh, stucco. But what is the advantage of the Alhambra is that it is in southern Spain. It has been extensively being restored by UNESCO. So maybe 100 years from now it will remain. But this is a minaret in Afghanistan. This will gradually grow like many others, like the Bamiyan Buddha and many other structures in the Middle East, they will all vanish. But Alhamra will stay. This is a very rigid geometric proportion which they followed. You will notice that there are nine divisions, 19 divisions here. And there are 18 divisions here. This rectangle of 18 division by 19 division was the basic rectangle on which their design was developed. And these are, you know, the tiles which are being made by the restorers, different kind of tiles which will be used for restoration. And they all follow, they actually come down and finally have to conform to this proportion, 19 by 18, which is followed all over. This is one thing about Islam, that the geometry was very, very rigidly followed. We talk about um, our own temples and uh, Dilwara temple, which is supposed to be very honored. But if you look at the geometry of Dilwara carefully, it is not perfect geometry. Even by seeing with you know your own eyes, you can make out without even measuring that the circles are not perfect circles. That was not allowed here. Everything had to be perfect. So this is, uh, I have now come to Morocco before I end my presentation. And you see Morocco also did not have the money of you know, Syria and Mecca and Medina and the Middle East. So therefore, they also resorted to uh, stucco and wood. And this is the influence in architecture of Alhambra. The lower part is tiles because lower part is dust by hand and the upper part is completely stucco. If you look at, if you remember the Palace of Lions, then you'll see the, the entrance part of most of the pavilions, they have something similar. 
in Palace of Lions in, in Alhambra. That's a direct influence of the Moroccan architecture. Now, there was one thing about the Spanish kings that they did not believe in destroying Islamic architecture when they conquered. They had great respect. I'm ending with a photograph of the Great Mosque of Cordoba because it was a wonderful piece of Moorish architecture in Spain. And when the Christian conquered it, what they did was they came and constructed a small church inside, completely destroying the geometry, completely destroying the rhythm and the proportion of the great mosque of Cordoba. And the king was so angry, he actually said, it is recorded, that what you have done here is normally done by all Christians when they conquer anything. But you have destroyed a unique world monument, monument uh, of uh, example of architecture. And I don't support it. I think that ends my presentation. For further research and study, you can go through this. Most interesting will be the sixth book, which is by Washington Irving, an American, who actually stayed for days and months together at Alhambra and written some very interesting stories on Alhambra. Thank you. Absolutely. Alcazar in Seville. Yes. Absolutely. Extremely similar. Fascinating talk, um, especially your uh, <clears throat> allusion to the fact that this was a golden period that the, in the Iberian Peninsula, the golden period being those centuries from the 8th till the uh, 12th, 11th. 11th, when the Muslims were ruling the Iberian Peninsula. Yes. Now, the, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in my historical study, I just wanted to add uh, was that uh, the uh, uh, it was a golden period which scholars, many historians have referred to as La Convivencia, which is the great harmony. Yes. And the reason for that is because the, uh, when the Muslims, they, prior to them, when, prior to the 8th century, when the Visigoths ruled, uh, the Jewish had a very low status, yes. social status. Yes. They were killed, expelled. But with the coming of the Muslims, the Jews were allowed to hold on to the religion and they were not massacred. So it's just that... It and there was, was no that, conversion, no forced conversion. <clears throat> but when the, when the Christians came with the Reconquista, the, this La Convivencia period seems to have just been, yes. you know, uh, lost and... Very uh, true. And so, um, and so I think there's something in the Spanish character that they didn't vandalize, uh, you know, any of these great monuments that you've shown us. There's some... Uh, accommodative spirit there, isn't They adapt a lot of things, including music. Flamenco music is largely, you know, North African. The flavor is North African. So just one other uh, observation. You mentioned that the restoration will uh, remain in Spain uh, over the next hundred years. Uh, and you pointed out to the uh, monument in Afghanistan uh, and you alluded to the Bamiya uh, Putha, but, but wouldn't it be fair to say that it was destroyed because of uh, religiosity? It did, it was built in the 6th century and it remained till 2001. It's only the Taliban that destroyed it. I'm worried that, you know, 100 years from now, 50 years from now, we will not be there. None of us will be there. Uh, it is an estimate by UNESCO that about 50% of these world monument sites in the Middle East will be destroyed. For what reasons, we are not here to you know, argue and discuss. But uh, when Bamiyan Buddha was you know, destroyed, UNESCO, like a toothless tiger, started shouting, but oh, what next? Nothing. And what I'm one... saying is that it belonged to a different religion. Now the Spaniards could have said this is an Islamic architecture, demolish. No, no, no. The, the point being, uh, Parthada, that the uh, structure from Afghanistan that you showed 
is Islamic uh, is an Islamic structure, and therefore it to be destroyed in the way that we see Afghanistan now is unlikely. And the Bamiya it is already the, getting destroyed. It, you know that may be with the normal flux of wear and tear, but destruction by deliberation, the way it happened with uh, Bamiya Buddhas, despite appeals from the entire world. Look, it lasted from. If, if I recall correctly, from 570 AD till 2001, you know, it, it bore the wear and tear uh, of whether it was, you know, it, it was an externally exposed structure that had been built. What I mean to say is, you know, there is no attempt by the Afghan people, by the Taliban, because you don't, they don't have the face to ask UNESCO. UNESCO would have gladly restored that tower that I showed you. It's in very poor condition. It will fall any time now. But since they have gone into that phase, they are not, they don't have the face to ask UNESCO. So one last question before I let you go on this, is what do you think of the restoration attempts that we have in India? Say the way uh, Jallianwala Bagh has been uh, put together uh, again. What is, what is your view on, on, on that? India is a funny country. There are some areas, some corners where, you know, authentic good restoration is taking place and not always funded by the government but uh, India is a very scary situation because when we see wherever we see government intervention they end up messing it up we see examples of that in West Bengal and Calcutta also it's not only that the other governments are to be blamed what Jallianwala Bagh has happened is you know cosmetic the next government, if they feel they can, you know, take it off. But there are certain restrictions happening in India where you cannot even take it off without damaging the original structure, which is very sad. I mean, there is a lack of awareness. People must go and visit other countries. I mean, they don't have to go to Europe. They can go to Philippines. They can go to Cambodia and see what is happening. It's amazing. They can go to Malaysia. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture. I haven't personally visited Granada, but uh, I was very interested uh, to see your, your uh, slides. Maybe I missed it, uh, but um, I just wanted to ask whether there is no mosque in this uh, complex. And uh, that to me, as I said, I might have missed it, but that was a little surprise. Uh, no, there was a mosque, but when the Christians took over, they built a very ugly, uh, church, which again the king commented that this should not have been done. But you know when something the conqueror uh, uh, come into any any uh, different religion, I mean they, they take over a religion, then the church is the first organization, the institution to you know, come in and establish their, in, in fact in the 14th and 15th century it used to happen. They, used to, they had to establish their superiority over everything else and they had to do it by you know creating a church by whatever way they felt. There was a mosque. There was only one mosque in that entire complex? Yes, there used to be one mosque. Uh, just a couple of less esoteric questions. You mentioned the disfigurement of the of, of Alhambra, removal of tides, etc. But one thing that was striking and thinking of um, monuments in India, a couple of things struck me. One is a complete absence of signage. I mean, here we love to put signs all over the place, do this, don't do that, etc., etc. There's absolutely no signage. Second, along the same lines, complete absence of security guards. And third, the question is, how does the restoration get funded? Is it by the government or does UNESCO finally actually put in some money when they recognize a site? Uh, India has about 32 UNESCO uh, declared monuments, sites, architecture sites. And if they ask for money, uh, then UNESCO has provided. Like the Humayun's tomb was entirely restored by UNESCO funding. Uh, so there are examples, but one has to you know prepare, a, and there are do's and don'ts. Like UNESCO, when they come in, they will be very strict about what cannot be done in future and that has to be respected. But uh, there is very little government funding, state or central. It used to be there earlier, with the earlier government, when we used to you know, prepare 
uh, estimates for all the structures that we want to restore and uh, there were times when we have received up to 100 crores from the central government for restoration and documentation of structures in this Bengal. But that has been uh, discontinued altogether from the Ministry of Culture. Uh, one thing good about uh, our uh, the CSR uh, now allows the CSR law by the central government from last year allows spending of money by all the corporates for restoration of heritage properties. So one can seek uh, some funding from the corporates. Good evening, everyone, the members of the library subcommittee, the chair, and everybody else associated with the club join me in thanking today's speaker, Sri Parthuranjan Dash, for this very illuminating, edifying, and stimulating lecture. Many thanks to the audience who have been participating in such a positive manner. Thanks to our president, Kunalda for introducing today's speaker. And finally, thanks to Gurudash and everybody else associated who did the technical support. Shebunti, can I please ask our first lady, Rumadi, to come and do the honors on the stage for today's speaker. Thank you again, Parthoda, for this, for this very, very enlightening talk. <laughs> Thank you all. Goodbye and good night. <laughs>